The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. The following program is closed captioned for the thinking impaired. By tomorrow, I will rule the world! <laughs> you think he's gone? He's not gone! That's the whole point! He's never gone! Is this some radical new therapy? You see? <laughs> well, I must have never been paying attention. And today I'm paying attention with Tom Duggan. Fred and Meredith sit down with Tom to talk about some breaking news. A community remembers slain Woburn police officer Jack McGuire. And an illegal alien from Lawrence is sentenced to 11 years in prison. Ira Keltz and Kiana Roy will share some startling stats on overdoses. And four Valley police chiefs discuss the opioid crisis. And what paying attention would be complete without a snarky rant from Tom. And now, the man people love to hate, and he loves that you hate him, Tom Duggan. Axel, like being back in Lawrence. Yeah, let that go. It's like I'm driving down Hampshire Street. It's like I never <laughs> left the city. Fantastic. Get some Daddy Yankee for next week. All right. We are at the very beginning. This is it. This is We've been working on this for a whole 10 days. I'm Tom Duggan. I'm your host. This is the Paying Attention Television Program Podcast. I should probably stop saying television because technically it's not television. Um, it is a uh, is an internet podcast, and at some point it'll be on television because we are going to market it to a TV station at some point. But uh, for today, uh, what I wanted to do was just give everybody an opportunity to um, to to hear what we're all about. Um, we've got a whole bunch of segments that we'll put it, that we put together for this show. This is our first show. We're going to go about an hour, and um, uh, we've got uh, Fred. Uh, Van Magnus. I always say it wrong. Is it Van That's Magnus? Okay. Van Magnus. It's Van Magnus. That's right. Van Magnus, who's um, who's a um, uh, going to be our news guy, one of our news guys, and we have uh, Meredith Warren, who I've known since she worked for the Evil Tribune. Ooh, ouch! Um, when wow. uh, when I was on the school committee back in Lawrence, back in like the eighteen hundreds, <laughs> back in like I was nineteen ninety six, I think. There you go. Um, I was I was I was on the school committee. She was covering the school committee. You were a royal pain in the. I was a pain in the ass. No <laughs> Still is. About it. <laughs> Our times never change. And I'd sit and I'd sit yeah. there and I'd sit there at the school committee table and they'd be just yammering on about stuff and I'd just be staring at her going, "Wow, she's really cute." <laughs> and I'd be like trying to flirt with her and I'm like trying to make eyes at her and then all of a sudden they go, "Doug, how do you vote?" And I go, "I don't know. I'm not even listening. What are you talking about?" Uh, what are we voting on again? So she was a little bit of a distraction. So I always like to have female distractions around because, quite frankly, I'm, I'm a sexist, at least according to today's standards of what sexism is. When I was growing up, it was just called flirting. Uh, today it's called sexual harassment. I'm not sure how we how we got there, but we'll talk about that a little later on in the show. Um, so I wanted to just introduce you guys, have you tell people a little bit about who you are, uh, what you're going to be doing here on the show, a little bit about your background, um, and then maybe we'll go into some news once you, you know. Sounds good. Right. That sounds great. We're going to turn the tables on you in a minute. We're going to ask you some questions that, about who you are and how we got here and where we're at. So, I'm a little overexposed, but if you need me to talk more, that's fine. Yeah, all right. All right. We'll figure it out. So um, I'm Fred Van Magnus. This is Meredith Warren. Uh, we have our own communications business. We used to work up at the State House. Meredith did work for Eagle Tribune. Uh, we advise small businesses and political candidates on a bunch of communications matters. We build websites. We do press releases, do corporate PR, all that sort of stuff. Um, and, uh, we also sell real estate. We have our own real estate brokerage firm. I'm an attorney by trade. Don't hold it against me. That's all right. Uh, we love attorneys. There you go. They keep me out of jail. We try. And they keep me from being sued. <laughs> yeah, that's better. It's even better. So, uh, yeah, that's a little bit about us. And, uh, obviously very excited about the, the new show here. Congratulations on that. Meredith, have anything to add? Or? No, I think I'd like to ask Tom a couple questions. Oh, you're going to tell us a little bit about you. Look how cute she is. She needs camera time. Fred kind of covered it. I mean, what else is there really to say? Well, it's Tom's show. I mean, we should ask him some questions. All right, right? that's fine. Whatever you want to do. However right, you want to work. Well, first of all, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, so you founded the Valley Patriot. Yes. That's no small feat. It's no. a big deal. Why did you start it? What's the mission of the Valley well, Patriot? Well, you know, we. we we were. I was always politically involved myself and my girlfriend at the time. We're going to city meetings and um, town meetings in North Andover, or city council meetings in Lawrence, and we pick up the Eagle Tribune the next day and go, "What the hell meeting were they at? Because this isn't this isn't anything like anything that we fucking saw last night at all." So we're sitting there going, "Like, well, if we only had another newspaper that could just tell the right story." And uh, we sat down with a bunch of friends and we kicked around some ideas and then we thought about it. And one day I got a uh, – because I was on the school committee, 
after I left the school committee, I wrote for a Spanish language newspaper, and they used to print my columns in English and then translate it to Spanish so that Latinos would know what we were saying. And uh, I had left there. And shortly after I left, people didn't know that I had left. I didn't announce that I had left. I just kind of left. Um, someone had sent me a packet that was about this thick. And it had sign-off sheets of school committee members that were using money that was designated for Lawrence school children to go out to eat after school committee meetings. Uh -oh. and the superintendent was approving it. And it was the four members of the school committee that were on the finance committee that were supposed to approve all the bills to make sure they were legal. Yep. So they were going out and having steak and duck and alcohol. <laughs> and they were charging it to the Lawrence school system. And they were approving their own bills. So I'm looking at all this stuff going, well, I'm not at the other paper anymore. What do I do with it? So I called in, I'm sure you know, Orion Johnson, oh, OJ, yeah. great Bulldog. guy. Yeah. I, I think he got a bad rap. Uh, he, I think he's, he's at the Herald now. He is, and he's a great, and he is a great reporter, and he's a great guy. Yep. I gave him everything. He gave it to the Tribune guy. I said, just don't, just don't tell him it came from me. Because tell him it came from me, they're not going to want to do this. Right. Um, I waited like two weeks, and I called him up and said, hey, I haven't heard. Are they, are they doing this story about the school board members ripping off the taxpayers? And he said, no, they're not. And I was like, I was waiting for him to laugh. And he didn't laugh. And I said, what do you mean they're not? He said, well, the Eagle Tribune likes Wilfredo LeBoy. They think Wilfredo LeBoy is the second coming of Christ. And he gives them a lot of good stories. Right. And they're not going to do the story because they don't want to make him look bad. And I was actually in the room with, with my girlfriend at the time and one of the guy. And I hung up the phone and I said, you know what? We need to start our own newspaper. If you have elected officials literally stealing, stealing money from children and the local paper doesn't want to cover it because they somebody involved as a favorite son, yep. what else are they covering up? Like, we need we need to start our own paper. Right. And that was like in, I'm going to say it was like October of 2003. And by March of 2004, we had published our first edition. And our front page story was the story that the Tribune didn't want to do. And we published the copies of the receipts with the sign-offs with all their signatures on it and the circling of the alcohol and all that stuff. And we put it in. And we start, We thought we'll start this paper. We'll probably do it for six months, and then we have to go back out and get a real job again. And here we are. We're getting ready to celebrate our 14th anniversary in March. Still uh -huh. driving the trip crazy. Still, Still driving, driving the trip crazy. crazy. Now, how many communities are you in now? We're 51 cities and towns now. And Massachusetts and New Hampshire, New right? New Hampshire, right. That's no small feat. I mean, oh. that's, that's a lot of papers. And the funny thing is, I, my plan was to do Lawrence, Bethune, and Andover, North Andover, and then march north into New Hampshire. Because right. this is where the need is up here in New Hampshire, where we're taping in New Hampshire today. Uh, at Two Guys Smoke Shop, by the way, come up and buy some cigars. Um, that was my plan. It was to march up 28 and take over southern New Hampshire. But organically, it grew in the opposite direction. We were getting calls from people in Groveland saying, hey, I own a coffee shop. I'd like to advertise you deliver in Groveland. Well, we do now. Yeah. Like, as soon as someone right. calls and asks, yeah, it's you guys like, are right, everywhere. sure. So that day, I hung the phone up, got a bunch of papers, drove around Georgetown, asked people to get the papers in there, and then called them and said, yeah, if you drive around Georgetown, we're everywhere. Yep. So he called me back two days later. He goes, you're right. I drove around Joytown. You guys are everywhere. So he came on board as an advertiser, and we used that model of that first phone call to determine where we were going to be next. So yep. we got a call from Bill Ricca. We ended up in Bill Ricca. We got a call from Tuxbury. We ended up in Tuxbury. We had the hardest time getting advertisers out of sale in New Hampshire because this is where I wanted to come. So I was actively up here trying to sell the paper, trying to sell the concept of what we wanted to do, and we kept getting pulled south. So right. I just finally just I put my hands up and said, look, sometimes you're just going to have to let things go on their own. Let's let this thing organically go where it wants to go. Right. And what's, wherever people want it, that's where we go. And eventually we'll end up in New Hampshire. And we did yeah. eventually end up in New Hampshire. And it's grown in a lot of different directions. So now we're here at Two Guys Smoke Shop yeah. and doing a podcast. But if you took a stop in between, you're also an author. So why don't you yeah. tell people a little bit about that? Yeah, so I've, I've written um, technically, don't tell anybody. I've written three books, actually. Uh, my first book uh, called Gynocentrism, I wrote it under a pen name. Uh, Michael Stone. I could say that now, but I was reading. I was writing it under a pen name for a reason that was relevant then, but no longer. Okay. Um, and then my second book was a. Uh, I co-authored with Tim Imholt. It was a, uh, a book about a boxer in Lowell who won five Golden Gloves. Yep. Uh, Bobby Christakos and growing up in the Acre and you know, the mafia that was in Lowell at the time right. and, and how he kind of got through all that. And then this latest one that we published is um, Heroes in Our Midst, which I was hoping we would have. Didn't we need to? Um, Sorry, they're they're in my car. We'll we'll, we'll have them for anybody that wants one after the show. We'll we'll sign some books for you. Yeah. Um, and basically that 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 was much more fun to put together because what we do in the Valley Patriot is on the front page every month we honor a local veteran that's still alive. Right. We want their families to know what heroes they are while they're here, and we want them to feel that pride. You know, I I always hated going to a veteran's funeral 
and hearing all the great things people said about their service and think, boy, if they were only here to hear that when they were alive. So we yeah. kind of use that concept for our front page story. And for the last 14 years, every month we put a local veteran on the front page. And we looked at, at the 13 year mark this past March and said, we've got all this material already written. Why don't we compile it into a book of local veterans? I wonder if people will buy it. But if not, at least we can give them to the local veterans that are in the book and like their families can feel right. like, hey, my grandpa's a hero. Yeah. yeah. Had no idea that the first day we hit Amazon, we sold a thousand books on Amazon. <laughs> Amazing. And I'm, right. I'm looking at it going like, okay, so this has got to be a mistake. There's another book called Heroes in Our Mates and they kind of mix them up. So I called Amazon. They're like, no, those are your numbers. Wow. Um, and we've probably sold another two or 3,000 books since then. Yeah. Uh, we always have some in the office. People are always dropping by going, hey, I tried to order your book and I'm having a hard time on this newfangled computer thing and we have them right there. So. so of all the stories that you've covered, which one are you most proud of? Boy, this, this, uh, that's a tough question. Um, we, we, broke a, we broke a story about two years ago. Um, I'm sitting in my office and I'm watching Fox News. No, I'm actually watching CNN. And they come on and they do a breaking story about a volleyball player in North Andover who's being kicked off as captain of the volleyball team because she was in an underage drinking party. And the story was that she was just a designated driver for her friend. I remember this. And then I flip over to Fox and they're telling the same story. And then I flip over to MSNBC and they're telling the same story. This poor girl who's the victim of a zero tolerance policy who was a designated driver at an underage drinking party just looking for her friend when the cops raided. And I was like, you know, if that was true, I know every cop in the Merrimack Valley, someone would have called and told me that. So I started making phone calls. I called the court. I called police officers. I called people who were involved in, 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 uh, in the courtroom, court officers, uh, anybody that I could. I called Chief Ryder, who's here. He's going to be coming on in a little while. Uh, I don't think he returned my phone call originally, but that's okay. Um, and when I, when I found out what the real story was, like I sat alone in my office in total amazement that I just watched CNN and MSNBC and Fox tell a totally bogus story. And the real story, as it turns out, was she wasn't a, a, a designated driver, that she was charged with underage drinking, you know, contrary to what CNN said, um, and that her mom had filed a Title IX lawsuit against the, against the town of North Andover. So this really had nothing to do with the zero tolerance policy. We found out from the superintendent there was no zero tolerance policy, but you wouldn't know that if you watched CNN or Fox. Right. So we just went and we researched the hell out of that story. And we posted, I think it was like 3,000 words on the, on the first one that we did. And we came out and we just exposed just what the truth was. Here, look, this is the truth. And what you saw on CNN was a lie. And if it could, the story couldn't get any more amazing. The second we posted that story, CNN pulled their story down. Fox pulled their story wow. down. Wow. And MSNBC pulled their story down. Yep. But they never came back and said, hey, for those of you who saw that story over the last couple of days, We've come to new information that that might not be the case, right. that there's more to it. No, they just let their they let their audience believe something that they flipping knew wasn't true mm -hmm. and just moved on. Right. And so I, I was very proud of that story because it was like from the local perspective, you always know whether something is bullshit or it's not if you go to arms. That's my theory. If you're looking at the at the local level in any community, you're going to know if the national narrative is, is bullshit or if it's not. Right. And um, and that kind of put us on the map a little bit. I mean, we were we've been out for twelve or thirteen years, but that really put us on the map nationally. Right. And since then, I still get calls from producers at Fox, MSNBC, stuff that we put up that they asked to use. Yeah. Um, well, something that always impressed me about you is your network of sources and your relationships with law enforcement, really all over the country. Can you talk about how you cultivated that and and why they feel comfortable speaking with you when maybe they're not speaking with other news organizations? Yeah, sure. Um, my my dad was a cop. So I grew up in a cop family. My uncle was my dad's lieutenant. He was his shift supervisor. My uncle Bob was also a cop at the time. My cousin Sean was a cop. So we had maybe like nine guys in the, in the family that were cops. In fact, I think um, uh, one of my relatives actually worked with Chief Bray from North Andover, who's also here for a segment that we're going to have shortly. Um, and my dad was, was killed in the line of duty. And so I became part of a group nobody ever wants to be a part of, police, what's called police survivors, family members of cops that have been killed. And over the last, you know, 25 years since my dad got killed, I've worked a lot with the Craig Floyd at the National Police Memorial with Concerns of Police Survivors, which is a, a network for uh, family members of cops that have been killed. Um, and so when I started the paper and I started going to police calls and I started calling cops to get information, 
They were thrilled to talk to me because they're used to talking to these snot-nosed college-educated reporters who come out of college hating cops because they've been given some kind of a stupid, phony, anti-cop narrative. And they felt at least comfortable that, like, if they gave me something, A, I was never going to say who my source was, and that, B, I was going to I was gonna do the story right. I wasn't going to take something that happened and try and twist it to fit a narrative to make the cops look bad or make the cops look good, that I was just going to tell the story. So as, as we went on with the paper and I was doing radio for a while, we'd have to come on the radio show. And once they, once the cops that, there were some cops that were a little nervous about it, right? Because I'm still a reporter. Right. They still don't want right. to trust you. Uh, but as they saw my product, as they listened to my show, as they picked up my newspaper, they realized I'm the most pro-cop guy there is out there. But I'm pro-good cop. So when we got stories, uh, one of my second favorite stories that we wrote was the corruption that went on under Frank Cousins, who was the uh, Essex County Sheriff. Mm -hmm. And everybody, it, the biggest criticism I get is, oh, the cops are always right with you no matter what. I say, yeah, Google Frank Cousins. Google Frank Cousins and Valley Patriot. You tell me that I'm pro-cop right or wrong. Because um, there was a guy that was just corrupt for the entire time that he was there, selling jobs. I mean, all, all the stuff that was going on. We will do a segment on him at some point because he, his head's popping back up in, in another area. Um, but, but they know that I, I, I'm pro-cop, but I'm pro-good cop. If there's a cop out there committing any kind of criminal activity, Something serious, not getting a free coffee at Dunkin' Donuts, but something serious. I'm going to be the guy to report it because the guys that he's working with, he's putting their lives in jeopardy. And nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop. So I think the good cops love me. Um, there's some cops that don't like me, I'm sure. Um, there's one guy in Lawrence that yells at me every time I get to a scene. Um, but that's okay. I'm okay with that because I get so much love from those guys any other time that when I run into a cop that gives me crap, it's like, listen, I'm. Everyone else deals with it nine times out of ten. I'm dealing with it one time out of ten. I'm okay. Right. That's excellent. Yeah. Well, it's obvious. you got four chiefs here. That's right. Yeah, in the first show, we get four Including chiefs. Including Gabriel in the house. Right. Get to them yeah. in a few minutes. There you go. <laughs> excellent. Awesome. And he's pretty bombastic. I can't wait to get to Nano <laughs> one here. Because my understanding is that his his mayor, by the way, his mayor hates him. I don't know if he'll admit that, but I know his mayor hates him. <laughs> and his mayor also hates cops because he's, he's a former defense attorney. Oh. So, you know, I, I was watching a city council meeting with uh, Chief DeNaro, and the mayor got up and said something about, uh, oh, we don't need any more cops, and the crime is going down, and I'm sure I'm butchering it, but it was something similar to that. And he got up, and he just, in the nicest, most professional way in the world, we basted Mayor Ferentini with facts and figures and made him look about this friggin' small. And, and I was just, I'm, I'm doing this, and I'm alone in my office, but I'm clapping anyway, right? <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward right. to having these guys on because the, the people that I'm going to be inviting on to this show are not going to be people who are going to be shy. Uh, the reason I purposely didn't invite the Lawrence, uh, the Lawrence chief on, I love, I love chief Fitzpatrick. Here comes the butt, right? But the guy can't have sex with his wife without asking Dan Rivera first. I mean, this guy literally, like I say hi to him and he checks his phone to make sure it's okay to say how, hi back. So he's, he's such a puppet for Dan Rivera. I knew that if I got him here, he wouldn't say anything of any, of, of any, of any interest or controversy. And I also knew that he would get shit for it from the mayor. And so I figured we leave him out of the first one. He'll see what we're doing with the other chiefs. Maybe that'll make Dan feel a little bit more comfortable and maybe can come on in the next one. Well, we want to get to the chiefs as quickly as possible. So uh, I think before we do that, we're going to take a quick look at some of the headlines that have been making news in the Valley Patriot. Yeah. There's some things going on right so, now. So we brought right. you guys on to do hard news. Yeah. And the rule is going to be, if you're doing news, no opinions. Because I'm tired of putting on Fox News and having them cheerlead for Donald Trump during their news. And I'm tired of putting yeah. on CNN and having them kick the crap out of Donald Trump during their news. So if you guys want to do just like straight news stuff, we can talk about it after just the facts. Just, cool. just, right. just, just the facts. Well, let's talk about a few of the stories that have been making news. And we're going to start out with one from Woburn, Massachusetts, where a group of mourners recently stood in bitterly cold temperatures for a vigil to honor the memory of Woburn police officer Jack McGuire. Uh, and they held a candlelight vigil uh, to remember Officer McGuire's sacrifice. And at the same time, the members of the Woburn police led a procession through the parking lot of the Woburn Post Office, which is now known as the Officer uh, John J. McGuire Post Office, right across the street from Coles. That was really nice of them to do that. It was. It was. Um, now, Tom, you remember, so Officer McGuire, he was murdered in the line of duty on December 26, 2010, at the hands of Dominic Sinelli. And there's quite a story behind Mr. Sinelli. It was later determined that he was a convicted felon who just two years before had been in prison serving a sentence of three consecutive uh, concurrent life sentences, excuse me, for armed and unarmed robbery, assault and battery by means of a dangerous weapon, 
assault with intent to commit murder, and escape. And despite those crimes, he was roaming free on the streets at the time of Officer McGuire's death because he was let out of jail by then-Governor Patrick's parole board back in 2009. It's outrageous. And as a free man, he and two accomplices used that post-Christmas blizzard uh, to go and rob the jewelry counter at Cole's department store, and they were in the process of fleeing the scene when they were confronted by Officer McGuire in the parking lot. Um, and uh, Sinelli turned and shot McGuire four times, but before he succumbed to his fatal injuries, uh, he was able to return fire and kill Sinelli, and the two accomplices were later apprehended. Uh, By the way, that was one of the most saddest funerals I've ever been to in my right. life. Like, my yeah. dad was pretty sad, but that was a very close second. Uh, it was really tough because Deval Patrick showed up at the funeral, mm -hmm. and he's the reason this guy's dead, and the family flipped out. They didn't want him there, but they couldn't say that publicly because everybody's supposed to burn a public face. It's a line of duty funeral right. and all that. Uh, that, that was tough. That was a tough one. Well, this vigil that was held, is I think it's now the, the seventh year that they've done it. They've done it every year since his death, and uh, quite a number of people showed up for it. And uh, local residents have also been invited to hang ornaments on a Christmas tree uh, that they have in Cole's parking lot uh, that's been lit in his memory. That's nice. And we're going to have some video of that, too. That's right. That's right. Mary? In other words, the Valley, in other news, sorry, the Valley Patriot learned earlier this year that Lawrence police officer Jeremiah O'Connor had died in the line of duty back in the 1950s but his sacrifice had never been recognized. Officer O'Connor has since been declared a line of duty death and his family given the last call they deserved at the Valley Patriots charity bash last Friday, last March. Great job on that. Tom. Thank you. Thank you We're going to do it again too for this guy. That's Great. excellent. Lawrence has another name to add to the police memorial in Washington, D.C., Officer Eugene Scanlon. A Lawrence officer and hero veteran of World War II in Korea, Eugene Scanlon died in 1972 from injuries he sustained after being savagely beaten by four men in the parking lot of Central Catholic High School during a high school dance. Officer Scanlon died 10 days after the brutal beating. This month, the state legislature, through the efforts of Lawrence State Rep. Frank Moran, has rectified that injustice as the House and Senate voted unanimously to declare Eugene Scanlon's sacrifice as officially in the line of duty. Governor Baker signed that bill last week. That's fantastic. Right. Tom, heading over to Lawrence, uh, three police officers. We love Lawrence stories. Oh, we have a lot of them. We're going to be doing There's always something happening. We're going to check a lot about Lawrence, and people at the beginning, I kind of understand why, but everything, everything, all the problems in the Merrimack Valley go back to Lawrence. We're going to talk. Well, this, this particular case, we had three police officers who were treated at uh, Lawrence General Hospital after saving a man whose car rolled over and caught fire last week. Now, witnesses told the Valley Patriot newspaper that a man ran a stop sign at the intersection of Kent and South Union Streets. We struck a police officer who was just leaving a uh, private detail. And there was a video that was taken by Jessica Reyes of Lawrence, and it shows the officers rescuing the man just seconds before the car exploded. Uh, and if, if you see the video, and I think this might be on the website, uh, Valley Patriot, and on Facebook later on, uh, but you can see the man's car rolled over, caught fire, and the Lawrence police, with the assistance of an off-duty firefighter, broke the car windows with at least one officer climbing into the burning car and pulling the man partially out of the car before four other officers were able to drag him to safety just seconds before that car exploded. Uh, the operator of the vehicle was a 70-year-old Haverhill man who was treated on the scene by paramedics and EMTs from Lawrence General and transported by ambulance to the facility. He was subsequently airlifted to Boston Hospital. He's still in serious condition. One officer was admitted to the hospital for smoke inhalation, and two others were treated and released. Heroes. All Quite a story. Heroes, guys. Quite a story. Quite you, a video. That goes you with don't it. hear that from Black Lives Matter. Quite a story. Right. Unbelievable. So in not-so-heroic news in Lawrence, uh -oh. an illegal alien who had been twice deported and sentenced for re-entry to the U.S. Don't tell me. He's from Lawrence. <laughs> was sentenced to 11 years in prison after pleading guilty to theft and conspiring to defraud the IRS. According yeah. to the evidence... By the way, you can sell all the drugs you want, and, and, and you could probably get away with it in most communities, but if you screw with the IRS... Exactly. You're, you're done. Don't want to do that. No. <laughs> According to the evidence, from 2008 through 2015, 45-year-old Fervio Fleet Garcia, a resident of the Dominican Republic, obtained the personal identification information of Puerto Rico residents and, without their knowledge, paid others to prepare and file tax returns with the IRS in their names. Shocking. I thought that, I thought we didn't have these problems. I watched CNN. They tell right. me we don't have these problems. Nothing. Yeah. No. These returns listed fake income and tax withholdings and sought fraudulent refunds. He would pick up the tax refund checks from addresses he controlled and cash them with co-conspirators for a percentage of their face value. Nice. Kind of smart, but yeah. in total, he negotiated over $7 million in fraudulent refund checks at two different ca check cashing businesses in Lawrence. Yeah, look, if you're going to put your freedom in jeopardy, don't do it for a couple of dollars. You, you're, go, go big. Go $7 million, yeah. $8 million. Thank you, honey. 
An additional $5 million in refunds were claimed on fraudulent income tax returns presented to the IRS from 2011 to 2015 using the identities of Puerto Rican residents whose identities were on lists obtained from Cleve Garcia and presented at trial. In addition to the term of prison imposed, Judge Leo Sorokin ordered Cleve Garcia to pay $7.7 million in restitution to the IRS. He was previously Sorry. sentenced in 2016 to 28 months in prison for illegal reentry into the U.S., misuse of a social security number, and aggravated identity theft. And you know what the best part of that story is? The best part of that story is what's not in the story. What's not in that story is we got a press release from the Department of Justice telling us most of this information. But in the press release, they never mentioned this guy was an illegal alien, and they never mentioned that he'd gone to prison for reentering the United States illegally. So, like, I'm, I'm reading through, and I, I, I originally posted the story just as they sent it to me, and my Facebook friends were like, oh, this guy's probably an illegal, and I'm like, well, let me find out. So I called the Department of Justice, and can yeah. I talk to your press person? Um, can I talk to the person who sent me this press release? I get the person on the phone, and I just, one question, what is this guy's immigration status? Was he here legally, illegally? Because, look, there's a lot of Dominicans who come here legally, and I don't want to cast aspersions on this, on this guy if he's here legally. No, no, she says, um, yeah, he's, he's been he's been arrested twice for illegally re-entering the United States and served time for it. And I'm like, and he's back? Like, I, <laughs> But I don't understand CNN again. I watch CNN all day in my office, and they tell me none of this stuff happens. Right. Like, uh, the mainstream media tells us outright lies, and we know they're outright lies because we live in the Merrimack Valley. And we can see with our own yeah, if right, it's actually happening. Right. Right. But when you get the press releases and they're purposely leaving that information right. out, we know that's an Obama-era thing. Um, and I asked the lady on the phone, I said, from now on, when you send me stuff, can you include their immigration stuff? She promised up and down that she would. But uh, I'm going to be very vigilant about stories like that when we get them to find out if they're illegal. Yeah, because, good for you. It's right. part of the story. Listen, right. like, like Donald Trump or not, when he comes out and he says something and the media says it's a lie. Right. And they're the ones lying. I think we need to call it out. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Tom, across Merrimack Valley, we have a politician who filed a bill this week. Um, this is Mass Democrat uh, State Senator Barbara Battalion, and she filed a bill Mass. to give free state IDs to poor people. Wait, wait, wait. Time out. Oh, okay. Here's a little. So Barbara Battalion, who's against voter ID because poor people can't get an ID, just filed a bill? Well, she filed the bill. Let me tell you about the bill. That poor people can get a free ID? Well, here's, here's the bill. It was filed on December 18th. It was following an article from a Boston newspaper about someone named Penny Shaw. She was a disabled elder rights advocate, and she was blocked from a state building because she didn't have a state ID. And she claimed she had only $72 each month for discretionary spending, and she could not afford to buy a state identification. Uh, now, according to the Italian, she said, quote, Disabled, elderly, and low-income people should not experience hurdles to accessing identification and with increased security. End quote. Now, Tom, mass residents pay a $25 fee to receive a state ID, and that's from the Registry of Motor Vehicles. Now, she, couldn't without, af- she couldn't afford the $25. Bucks. She said she couldn't afford the $25, bucks, $72 a month. Now, without Listen, a, I'm, I'm poor. I get that. I'm, well, not, I'm not disputing that at all. Well, what, what she's saying, so without a state ID, some residents uh, would lose access to public buildings like she did. They would lose state and federal services, medical care, legal resources, and even the right to vote. Now, Senator Latalian's bill would eliminate the application fee for a driver's license or a non-driver state ID for individuals who are at or below 300% of the federal poverty line. Now, there's no word yet as to whether or not state IDs will be provided to illegal aliens, which has also been a big issue on Beacon Hill recently. It's going to be, right? be my next question. There you go. We'll have to wait and see. So, all right, so I get, maybe I should save this for my rant, but so Barbara Latani, who's against voter ID because poor people can't get IDs, just filed a bill to give poor people free IDs so I think the follow-up question for Barbara Latine is, now that poor people have free IDs, are you for voter ID? Maybe she'll come on the show. You can ask her. Yeah, we're going to have to ask her. You, 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 want a, you, you want a little prediction? I think you should invite her right now. Right. You want a prediction? The prediction is going to be no. She's still not going to support voter ID because her party won't let her. Well, we'll have to see. All I right. love that story. That's a great, that's a great story. Because yep. <laughs> when we do the follow-up story, it's going to sound so much more absurd with this background story right. behind yeah. it. There you go. So in a little bit of business news, the company Ibar, a a private direct lender for commercial real estate, has provided a $5.7 million loan for the purchase of a 560,000 square foot high-end manufacturing facility in Lawrence. This is on the former uh, Polar Tech plant site. It's uh, 14 and a half acres of land. As textile manufacturing has largely moved overseas, the borrower says it's reimagining the use of the space for warehousing, data storage, office space, and light industrial work. The building's currently va- vacant, but iBorrow officials say they will be undertaking an aggressive marketing campaign with a nationwide leasing firm to attract new tenants in the coming months. 
Let's continue the news now across the border up in Manchester, New Hampshire, where Governor Chris Sununu pointedly blamed his state's opioid crisis on the city of Lawrence, Massachusetts this week. Uh, speaking to business leaders in Manchester, Governor Sununu said he knows exactly where the illegal drug fentanyl being found on the streets of New Hampshire is coming from. Can I guess? Can I guess? You can guess. Can I guess? You can guess. Take me. All right. Lawrence? You're right. Hey, how about that? You know what he said? It's coming from Lawrence. 85% of the fentanyl in this state is coming straight out of Lawrence, Massachusetts. Now, the governor said New Hampshire needs to do much more to address the opioid crisis, including crossing over state lines, if necessary, to stop the flow of deadly drugs into his state. Get this. He said he's informed the governors of neighboring states, including Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker, of his intentions, and he told them to, quote, get ready, we're going in, end quote. Baker's spokesman released a statement reaffirming the governor's commitment to the war on drugs, saying in part, quote, the Baker Polito administration has stepped up law enforcement efforts to end trafficking, invested millions of dollars in prevention and treatment, created a national blueprint to fight the epidemic that other states have modeled. We'll have more on the opioid crisis later on the broadcast. Yeah. And we're kind of running out of time, so I don't know how many more uh, stuff you've got left. Yeah, probably leave it there if you want. Okay, great. You, you want to get to these chiefs. Was there, so. one more, was there one more at the end of your thing? It was a police-related one? Do you have another police-related story? Uh, is that out of North Andover? Uh, we can do that real no, quick if you want. No. There was the Valley Patriot victory lap. Uh, Loretta Cook story. Oh, yeah. You, you do, do that one real quick. Right, we'll do that real quick. Do it real quick. All right. So Loretta Cook of 26. We want to put her Loretta picture up, too. Nice story. Go here. <laughs> All right. Loretta Cook of 26 Overlook Drive in the Thuin filed a restraining order. Fred, where's my story? I, I don't know. You got it? No. Nope. You need this story. For yeah, sure. Use this. Filed a restraining order last month against Valley Patriot columnist Dr. Barani, claiming his columns mentioning her in the paper were harassment. Cook asked Judge Michael Ulrich for a restraining order against the doctor and the Valley Patriot newspaper, barring them from writing about her or taking or publishing her photographs. But Cook is a public employee with the Mass Board of Registration and Medicine and is intimately connected to a case involving Dr. Barani's license to practice being suspended by the board. Dr. Barani has chronicled the board's corruption extensively over the last few years in the printed pages of the newspaper. The doctor says that Cook was trying to preemptively stop the newspaper from covering his upcoming civil suit against Cook for corruption. This sounds like a big mess. Yeah, it is a big mess. Wow. <laughs> Judge Ulrich dismissed the charges against the newspaper and Dr. Barani explaining that there has to be three requirements to meet the definition of harassment for her to prevail in court. Cook failed to prove even one of the legal elements of the harassment claim. This is the eighth legal challenge to the Valley Patriot on First Amendment grounds. Right, I get sued a lot. The Valley Patriot has yet to lose a case. That's a pretty good record. Yeah, we're eight for eight. That's not bad. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. good. Well, thank there you, you very much. There you go. All right. <laughs> the Diadema one was the toughest one, but I think we signed a non-disclosure, so I don't think I can give any details on that no. one, but that one, was, that was the toughest one. He was selling, suing us for like a gazillion billion dollars. I didn't even no. know what the number was. I didn't even know there was a number that high that yeah. he was trying to sue us for. Uh, but we got, through, we got through all of them. And, you know, when you are somebody who is going to try and call it like it is, you're going to piss people off. And when you piss people off, sometimes you piss off people who have lots of money or power. And they're used to pushing the, pushing you know their weight around. And uh, so we do get sued a lot and because we, we write stories that no one else wants to write. Right. So far, we've been on the prevailing side. So I, I always try when we're putting stories together to make sure we're not slandering anybody, to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. But just because just because you did everything right doesn't mean they can't sue you. Right. And so it's cost yeah. us thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, we would probably be double the size of what we are right now if we hadn't spent the thousand, tens of thousands of dollars on legal fees that we have over the last 14 years. Right. Well, it's all about telling it like it is. That's what you'll be doing on paying attention in future episodes. But yeah. for now, those are your headlines. Excellent. So we're probably gonna, we're probably going to go a little over time today because we're all, we're a little bit late. We're two thirty four. We come back. We're going to have Ira Kelts. I said it right, right? And Kiana Roy are going to come and they're going to talk about the opioid crisis. They put together like a little three to five minute presentation. And then when they're done, we've got four police chiefs that are going to come sit here with us and talk about the opioid crisis in their communities and what they're doing to combat it. We'll be back after this on the Paying Attention Television Program where everybody gets it except Colonel Sam Bolton. Before we get to our police chief segment, which I'm just dying to get to, um, Kiana Roy and uh, Ira Kelts are going to be uh, some of our news people. They're going to be some of our production people. They're going to take on a lot of different roles. I'm glad to have both of you here because you're both very good. We are thrilled to be here. Tom. I, that sounded almost sincere. I appreciate that. That's awesome. <laughs> it's early. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, j just start real quick with just telling people who you are and you know what why you're here. Uh, my name is Kiana Roy, and I'm here. Because, I have, you, because you look good. Because I look good. Yeah, that's, that's my reason. Here. Wait, hold on. <laughs> that's actually the sole reason why I'm here. Yeah, it really kind of is, actually. Yeah. I have no idea what your talents are, but I saw her, and I was like, yeah, she's got to be on the show. Thank you. All right, excellent. <laughs> and Ira? And I'm Ira Keltz. Um, I'm here to do news, straight news, uh, with the show and add a little, little comedy fun. Um, I have some background in public access TV and news and production. So I'm thrilled to be part of the oh, show. We get to watch you in Westford. I've been watching some of your stuff online. It's pretty good. Westfordcap.org. You can now, check out all of our shows. Now, people think Ira is like this super serious, stiff guy, right? And, Depends on Viagra. And then the camera goes off, and he's actually the funniest guy in the room. So I want to try and pull his, his personality out a little bit and have him be less Westford cat guy and be more paying attention guy. All right. Uh, if you could do that. But I don't want to take up too much more time because we're holding the Chiefs up, and they've got, like, crime to go fight. So why don't I let you guys do your thing? Okay. All right. So um, the opioid epidemic – is continuously a top highlight in current news. It appears that each year we're seeing a rise in deaths, and they're directly attributed to the use of opiates, is what we're seeing in the younger generations. And NPR.org this week reported that the opioid crisis directly impacted for a second year in a row the age expectancy in the United States. So for a second year in a row, it dropped from 78.9 to... the life expectancy of how long someone lives? Yep, in America. Oh, okay. So it dropped from 78.9 to 78.8. It actually went down? It went down okay. again for a second year. I don't even think it did that in, like, World War II, did it? I don't think it did. Like, we can look it up. Uh, uh, Christine's my personal assistant. She can look that up all later. Yeah. So for a second year in a row, we're seeing um, a direct hit in the life expectancy, which is being directly attributed to all the deaths in the younger generations, primarily that 20 to 40 age group from opioid-related crises that are happening. So with Massachusetts, specifically Florence, uh, that we're covering today, being called the center of the opioid epidemic by politicians and public safety, we decided to take a little bit of a further look into the numbers that are being reported. So Ira Keltz is going to take a dive into those numbers and see where we fit. Yeah, Ira. Kiana, appreciate yeah, it. Uh, Ira. Ira, yeah. So the Massachusetts Department of Public Health reports that in 2016 there were 2,094 opioid-related overdose deaths. How in many? The Commonwealth. Over 2,000, almost 2,100. That's where? Phenomenal. In, in uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, wow. yeah. And that's up 24% over 2015. In the first nine months of 2017, which is in the most recent ones available, there were 932 confirmed opioid-related overdose deaths. That's outrageous. Yeah, and the DPH estimates that there will be an additional 491 to 582 more deaths through the end of this year, so basically this week. Um, so that we're talking about 1,400 to 1,500 deaths, which is actually good news compared to previous years. But, you, but, you know, not for anything, but if, if there was a product, if Coca-Cola or Pepsi – created a product that had a poison in it that killed 2,000 people in Massachusetts last year, I, I, I'm positive that our government officials would find a friggin' way to fix that problem. Like, like the they would lights, find a way to something. attack that problem and make those numbers better. And it doesn't like seem like, I mean, I know the cops do their job, but the politicians really seem to screw in the pooch on this. I think. It's, it's tough. Let's talk about Massachusetts. Um, so basically, we talked about Massachusetts. New Hampshire public radio referenced a report from the Centers of Disease Control last week saying that New Hampshire has the third highest rate of opioid-related deaths among all U.S. states, behind only West Virginia and Ohio. Wow. And New Hampshire is expected to close out 2017 with about 466 overdose, overdose deaths, which is about 20 fewer than in 2016. Now, we can break that down by county. And in Massachusetts, Middlesex County, which includes Lowell, Milrica, had 416 deaths in 2016, which is up from 357 in 2015. Those graphics are great, by the way. Thanks. Essex County covered Lawrence and Methuen, had 288 fatal opioid ODs in 2016, which is up from 245 the previous year. Let's look at New Hampshire. Um, Hillsborough County, which covers the cities of Manchester and Nashua, there were 199 deaths in 2016 compared to 178 in 2015. Still going up. Rockingham County, close to us, which covers the state of New Hampshire, Portsmouth, and Derry, there were 90 deaths in 2016, almost flat from 2015 when there were 89. And finally, let's look down at the uh, selected cities in Mass. Boston, of course, led the Commonwealth with under 200 deaths, followed by Lowell with 69, Worcester with 64, Lynn with 49, and Lawrence with 46. Now, you're thinking only 46 in Lawrence? We'll, we'll talk about, more about that later, but all these towns, with the exception of Worcester, had significant increases in deaths over 2015. Other towns with high numbers of opioid-related deaths in the state include New Bedford, Manchester, New Hampshire, and Nashua, and we'll talk more about these deaths later on in the show. So, Kiana, this is obviously a huge story that folks are aware of, but it, it appears that people really don't have a grasp of the scope here in the Merrimack Valley. Why is that? Well, the thing is a lot of these numbers that are actually being presented are just what's been confirmed. 
Unfortunately, the numbers that are being reported don't reflect the actual number of deaths that could be directly attributed to opioids, numbers that aren't being reported, numbers that aren't being confirmed. So the numbers that you're seeing as astronomical as they are could potentially be so much higher. And these numbers are shocking. What, right. what do you mean by higher numbers? Like what's reported? Aren't the numbers the numbers? No, I mean, technically what you're happening, what you're seeing coming up is toxicology testing isn't being done. Um, it takes time. It's money to conduct. You're seeing many families that are, you know, familiar and current with the opioid epidemic. However, they don't want to admit that it's touching their families. The other thing that's not being reported in these numbers is how many people in Narcan. So you have, so you have someone who dies, and, and you know, Joe Solomon sends his guys out into filming, and they go, and the guy's dead, and they Narcan, and he comes back. That's not reflected in these numbers. These are just the people that died that didn't come back. Clearly, clearly so, dead, dead. Not no zombies are so counting these numbers. You could probably double or triple those numbers, and what we're going to try to do for future shows is get those numbers, add them into these numbers, so we can provide our viewers real numbers, not what the politicians are talking about and not what the stupid media is talking about. And also on top of that, these numbers that are being reported are only those that are confirmed, have been tested, that are being released, that the families are allowing that to happen. This isn't including overdoses that are happening where they're being brought back. It doesn't include the people who aren't reporting toxicology, the families who are deciding not to send in toxicology. It seems that... This is kind of the most talked about but hushed crisis when it actually hits families personally, even in obituaries. Um, on Facebook, you're a lot of the time seeing person died suddenly. You're not seeing lost battle to addiction. That's, that's true. Never, and especially never. kids, too. I notice when I'm, when I'm reading the obituaries, you'll see, it'll just say sudden death yes. for a person. Um, and I don't know that those numbers are being included in if, if, it's, if it's a kid and it's opioids and maybe the parents just aren't telling anything. Yeah. Imagine what could happen if families start to share publicly you know, the family's personal tragedy and, and use that to positively impact the lives of others who may be struggling. Right. And also the, the opioid epidemic is a topic that we're going to continue to look at each week. Each week we'll look at a different aspect, go a little bit deeper into the factors that are actually contributing to this widespread epidemic. All right. I got one more thing I want to talk about on this. I'm going to bring the chiefs up. Um, can we, Jonathan, can we pull up the number that you, that he showed uh, by city and put it side by side with my red graphic that we put together, that Christine put together? I don't want to take credit for her work. She did good Absolutely. work. Absolutely. Give me one second. Um, so, and the reason I want to bring this up is because um, I always like to present the news and present information to people from behind the curtain. And the media likes to spruce everything up and make it look pretty to make someone look good, make mm -hmm. someone look bad. Um, so if you look at these numbers, the original numbers showed Lawrence was like sixth in Massachusetts, right? right? But then we did it by capita, and we had Christine run some numbers, and Rich actually gave us some, some good numbers too. Um, and if you look at it by capita, Lawrence is first. Lawrence has, a, has one death per thousand and eight people. And then the next town down, I think it looks like it's um, Lowell. And that looks like one death per 1,500. People. That's huge. That's like it's so. Even though awesome. even even though Worcester has more opioid deaths than Lawrence, if you do it per capita per person lives in that community, Lawrence is number one. And we we, we actually had a meeting last week where we where I said Lawrence is number one, but the numbers we have doesn't show that. So if I'm wrong, let's just go with the numbers that that I'm wrong about. You're never wrong. But but let's 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 delve into the numbers. And when we delved into the numbers, and we pulled this graphic up. It was like, holy crap! I was right. You're right. Because yeah. because Lawrence is look. There's a reason that it's Lawrence. I'm going to talk about that in the next segment. There's a reason that this stuff is Lawrence, and we're not picking on Lawrence. I'm so friggin' tired of Dan Rivera and uh, an elected official saying, oh, you're kicking us while I'm down. Maybe this is racism. Maybe it's because we have brown skin. No, it's because you have fentanyl labs on every friggin' corner. That's why we're talking about Lawrence. The 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 uh, the Justice Department held a huge bust in June. We were actually the only newspaper there to cover. We were the only one with a photo of it, of fentanyl dealers in Lawrence. And when they had their press conference after they arrested all these guys, they talked about how a finger of heroin in Lawrence is four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Take that same finger of heroin and go up to Manchester, New Hampshire, it's twelve hundred. You go up into Maine and it's twenty two hundred. So we know from supply and demand, we know from capitalism and, and studying economics. That things are the cheapest where they are the most plentiful. Yeah. So the the meth labs, I mean the, the fentanyl labs are in Lawrence. They are cutting it in Lawrence, they're packaging it in Lawrence, and that's why it's as cheap as it is in Lawrence. And that's why people from Maine drive to Lawrence to get their drugs. I don't know why that escapes the mayor. I don't know why they haven't been able to tackle that, but we get the chiefs up here, we'll talk about how they're doing it. Sounds good. Coming up after, coming up after the break, Tom Duggan sits down with four chiefs of police from the Merrimack Valley to get their take on the opioid crisis in their communities. How are the different communities handling the epidemic? And um, 
you know, what, what about the numbers? So we'll be back right after this. All right, we'll be back after this. I'm paying attention. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to make something very clear. Blue lives matter in America. Stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, excellent. Are we back? All right, we're back here on the Paying Attention Television Program podcast. Uh, you can find us on my Facebook page. You can find us on our YouTube page. Go to Valley Patriot. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Go to go to Tom Duggan or the Valley Patriot on YouTube. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter and all of our social media accounts. Um, we have asked four police chiefs to come in and talk to us about the opioid crisis. I don't think it gets talked about enough. Some people think it gets talked about too much. But when you're talking about 2,000 to 3,000 people in a state dying every year or something, I think it's important to spend a lot of time on it. We're going to be doing that not just in today's show. We're going to have a, a rotating opioid crisis update every single week for you. Um, sitting here with me, I'm, I'm amazed we got all four of them in today. I called all four thinking maybe I'd get one. I got all of them. Uh, to my left, one of my favorite chiefs in the world. Sorry, nothing against any of the rest of you, but I've known, I've known uh, Chief Solomon for a little bit longer. We've been... We've been through some scraps together, too, so we've, we've kind of been through some wars. Uh, Chief Joe Solomon to my left. Uh, to his left is uh, Chief Ryder from Boxford. Um, we've actually also had a little bit of fun together, too, right? Yes, we did. And, and then to his left is Chief DeNaro, who I just can't wait to hear from because I know he's got some really good stuff for us. And then a guy on, the, on, the far, on my far left, your far right, a guy who is a cop's cop. This is a guy who, even as Chief is going out and answering calls, uh, when the guys from L.A. came in to do the movie, um, they asked me which chiefs to go talk to. And I said, make sure you talk to Solomon. Make sure you talk to Gray. Um, and make sure you don't talk to Fitzpatrick because he's not going to give you anything anyway. Um, but uh, but ever since I've known Chief Gray, since he was a patrolman, uh, every time I saw him, he was wrestling with someone on the ground. He had somebody trying to, uh, trying to throw a shot at him, throwing somebody trying to punch him. Uh, he, this guy's a cop's cop. He's not one of these guys that sit, sat behind the desk for his entire career and then just elevated up into chief. He's a real cop. So I want to throw this to you guys. You you heard the news stories that we talked about. Obviously, you live it every day. Um, and I'll let whoever wants to go first go first. Um, what are you finding in your community with this opioid crisis? Is it as bad in your community as it is everywhere else? And how are you handling it? Tom, can I go first? Sure. Uh, sure. I'd like to first start off with, because we there was talk about Lawrence earlier. Yeah, sure. To just say that. Not any one of us here will say we work with Lawrence very well. And Chief Fitzpatrick and his uh, men and women have a real tough job. Yeah. We support them 100%. And they can do what they can do based on the manpower they have and the support that they have. But we support Chief Fitzpatrick and his men and women completely. And they work fantastic with us. We have a great open relationship. And it is unfortunate that uh, a lot of the drugs come into Lawrence for distribution. But that doesn't isn't a negative on the police officers. Right. They're really fighting that battle. But I just wanted to say that because, honestly, uh, Chief Fitzpatrick talks to us almost daily, and we fight the battle together. And we've really, in Merrimack Valley, we believe we're all a family, and we all work together to fight this battle. And I, can I just say in full disclosure, I'm not ripping on Fitzpatrick. I know when I see him, he says, why are you always breaking my balls? I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not attacking Fitzpatrick. I'm attacking Dan Rivera for not letting him loose. I'm attacking Dan Rivera for tying his hands behind his back and not allowing him to come out and talk about some of this stuff. I can't tell you how many times I've asked him, listen, can you just give me some numbers on opioids? Can you give us some numbers on what it's costing the city every time you go out to do a Narcan? And the answer I get is you have to talk to the mayor. And, you know, you might as well just talk to a wall at that point. So I'm, I'm not ripping on Chief Fitzpatrick. I think he's a great chief. I think the Lawrence Police Department is one of the best in the state. Um, my frustration is political, not against him. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. And so for us uh – and we were listening to statistics earlier. Our overdoses this year are down 25% compared to last year and 30% compared to the year before. However, our deaths have doubled. Really? And we attribute that to the fentanyl, that it's fentanyl and not heroin, where over the years we've seen heroin, heroin, heroin cut with fentanyl, and then heroin cut with a little more fentanyl. Now it's just pure fentanyl. And kids that are taking pills that they think is a Percocet, a Vicodin, a Xanax, is actually uh, fentanyl. So we're seeing the deaths increase in my city, but the total number of overdoses go down. And I think what we've surmised from our statistics is the overdoses are down in Methuen because we're not getting the calls. 
people are carrying Narcan themselves, we might get the call two or three days later that, well, you know, we Narcan them twice and now we need to go to the hospital. So we believe the proliferation of Narcan is saving lives. Uh, and again, what's the cost? Every time we go out, somewhere in the area of $125 to $130, depending on the actual Narcan cost because it fluctuates. But is it worth saving 250 lives, even if it's $120 a life? And uh, I've had this argument with people where uh, a man confronted me and thought we were wasting money and we shouldn't be using it. You know, me and you have talked about it. You wrote the article about are we enabling or not. Right. And, and you, I, you brought up a thing that I thought was great during that interview, and I think it needs to be repeated here. And that's you know, when I said to you, you know, there's a lot of people out there who say, well, there are a bunch of junkies. Why are you, you going to bother? And the chief said to me, well, look, if someone's a diabetic and they don't eat right and they, and they keep eating pizza and they keep not taking care of themselves and they have a heart attack, do we not, do we not go take care of them, you know, take care of their health? Do, do, we, do we not try to revive them if they die just because it's their fault? And I thought that was a great. I thought that was a great thing. Thank uh, you. And, and that's really where I was going. And sorry. I'll pass it on to them. No, I'm, I'm glad you, you said that. Um, and I also believe that all of us uh, are doing the outreach afterwards. So it's not that we knock in you. We just send you away. Here's your candy. Come back and overdose again. You go right into our program. Our, our addiction specialists come right out. They try to get you into an immediate uh, rehab. We try to get you in, detox you, then move you into a short-term care and long-term care. Um, sometimes over the last weekend, uh, our work has worked, uh, our two civilians, they worked like for 27 hours to finally wow. get someone placed. It's usually not that hard, but it was a holiday. So Narcan to me is not the solution. Narcan is the band-aid or the tourniquet that saves your life. We move you to the next level, then our addiction specialists help you get through the system. So now, we are making progress and then I'll pass yeah, it Now, on. Chief Ryder, um, if, if, um, if, if we have this huge opioid epidemic you're in a small community of boxford right it's just it's this quaint little town. like i drive through boxford especially in the wintertime it's just so beautiful it's a great spot it's all single family homes it's predominantly white it's predominantly you know wealthier middle class um when we look at the statistics those are the people who are the victims of this stuff i mean it's, it's the white middle class that's dying every day from the, how are you guys handling that in boxford we're obviously carrying Narcan in all our cars. We've used about 20 doses since 2015, and we deal with the families. We see the crisis that's left behind when there is addiction in the household, and it's crossing all age groups from your late teens into your 50s, and we're constantly aware and constantly on a lookout, and it's a regular occurrence. It's one of those things that you didn't see it coming over the years, but here it is, and it's been building for a while. Do you have to put your guys through any kind of special training? Um, because this is all kind of very new for everybody, right? Just in the last four or five years that this is kind of exploding. So do you send your guys for special training, especially like I know you guys deal with the schools too. You've got a vocational school that you guys have to kind of go in uh, with some of the other communities and, and police once in a while. What are you seeing with all that? Well, we have a regional high school. We have not seen many issues in the high school. We're seeing it right outside the high school age. And we've watched it. It happens with different groups of kids. It's seen as throughout generations, whether it be from the class of 1979 through this class right now, and you're seeing pods of different kids that get hooked up in that culture, and then a lot of times they come back to their family, then there's something we have to deal with, we have to work with the family, we have to work with the kids, and we see what happens as far as the devastation of that. Have you seen the numbers in Boxford fluctuate? Are they pretty steady, or are they like everywhere else where they just kind of like doubling your year? They're definitely getting, I don't say doubling, but they're definitely getting more prevalent, but a lot we don't see a lot of it because there are people that try to take care of it inside their house. They have the ability to hopefully send people away, whether it be kids or family members away, and get treatment outside the community. And we hear bits and pieces of some of it, but we then are also on the front lines a lot of other aspects of it. That's great. And I will come back to you because I have a couple more questions. Chief Denaro is from Haverhill. Now, Haverhill is a very different community than Boxford or even, Haverhill, or even McFillin. Bethune's a city, but it's not really a city. It's a town that's kind of a city. Boxford is a town. Haverhill's like Lawrence. Haverhill has a lot. You have a large population. You have a large population of poor people. You have a large population of immigrants. That's got to pose the same kind of problems as Lawrence. Can you talk about what you guys are doing? We, um, we currently have a sergeant, two patrol officers, who are designated as my contacts. And we have a caseworker, a social worker, from NFI who goes out with them we contact every person who overdoses. In the last two years, we've had over 500 ODs. Wow. Um, and 
they will contact those people and try to get them into programs. Um, we also, uh, when we have a death, last year we had 23, this year we have 14 to date, so they are down. Uh, we go and we meet with the family, we get them into grief counseling and, and see what we can do from uh, on that aspect. Predominantly one of the biggest problems that we have is that when they knock on the door, 99 of 100 times the door shuts, nobody wants to talk about it, nobody wants help, everybody's okay. When I talk to my officers when we're utilizing Narcan, once they wake people up, people don't want to go to the hospital. They're all set. I'm good. I'm out of here. You know, no problem. So th there are a lot of there are a lot of issues as far as being able to address this problem. And, and as uh, Chief Solomon alluded to before, our overdoses, well, last year, I think, to date, we were 262. This year, we're 249. But that's a grossly understated number. Because when we talk to the people out there, they're openly telling us, yeah, we have Narcan, and when somebody goes down, we revive them. Right. And then they don't call us. And they're not reporting it. Absolutely. So, so the numbers that Kiana and Ira read earlier are probably double or triple those actual numbers because of, the, of what you guys are explaining. People are actually using the Narcan, not calling it in. They're not reporting it to anybody. So those numbers are just completely – they're just they're in, in the atmosphere. I think a better, a better gauge would be to determine – um, all of the agencies that are giving out Narcan, how many doses are you giving out? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Because that would give you a pretty good idea of, of the extent of the problem. Maddie, write that down and we'll start calling We'll start calling around for the next show and find out the answer to that question because hopefully there is an answer to that question, right? Yeah, yeah because they, I'm sure there is because there are agencies that are giving this stuff out for free. They have to track it. I'm right. sure there has to be some type of check and balance for that. Now, I, just to get off topic a little bit, um, you because you're in such a tough community like Haverhill, and you've got a mayor who's a former defense attorney that hates cops. We know he hates cops. He tries to pretend that he's nice to cops, but he's not. Um, how is that for you as the top law enforcement officer who has to be in charge of the safety of everybody in the city of Haverhill and everybody in your department who's dealing with the people on the streets? Um, how, how, do you, how do you handle that other than what I saw at the city council meeting that night, which is phenomenal, by the way? Just throwing the numbers at him and just making him look like a fool. But how, how do you handle – you get hostility on the street from the drug dealers, from the criminals, from even some of the, just the regular members of the public who don't like cops. You're getting crap from your own cops sometimes. And then you're getting crap from the people that are above you. How do you how do you handle that? Well, I have a very supportive city council, as, as you know, if you've watched the, the meetings. For the last – I'm in my 16th year as the chief, and, and I have never had a, a council that has not supported what we're trying to do and how we do it. Uh, I'm very fortunate the way my contract is written is that I'm in charge of police services. I get to decide how to utilize those resources, where to put them, how to deploy them, from the bicycles and police cars down to the officers themselves. So um, I get to make those decisions, and the mayor understands that. I think he respects that, and it really doesn't. He might make a suggestion, but ultimately the decision on how we approach something, how we do something, um, is left up to the chief of police. So. Did he ever fix your police station? We did a big story about the the, uh, the mold in the police station and, the, and the, the fact that the roof was never put on right. I will um, say this, that um, right now we are going out to Bond to finish the windows. but um, Five years later? 20 years later? We're having a huge problem with the solar company that put panels on a new $450,000 roof and put uh, holes in it. It's just total mismanagement. Like, how do, listen, if I was in that environment, I would just quit. Like, How do you, how do you go to work every day like that? Like, How do you do that? I do that because I love the job. I mean, I don't love the politics of right. the job, but that's a, it's a big part of the chief's job. So, I mean, I, I get it, but I kind of focus on there's 65,000 people that we protect. I have 105 sworn officers or department that size. So, you know, we have commitments and responsibilities outside of the, the political aspect of it, and I kind of focus on that. Great. And sometimes I hit a landmine every now and well, then. But I, I've, I, I've noticed that, but you I, handle it well. Though. I, I, I have try to not say. to. I have to say you handle it well. I, I, I – I, I, I sometimes I'm doing this on the TV screen when I'm watching when you're talking because I'm like, wow, Solomon's the only guy I know that could get away with doing that anyway. Uh, Chief Gray from North Andover. Now, you've got a very different uh, community. North Andover borders Lawrence like Methuen does, but it's a town. And like Boxford, it's, uh, it's mostly middle class to upper class. It's mostly white people. Um, it's people who have a little bit more disposable income um, than Lawrence or Methuen does. And yet, you guys see the same types of problems Lawrence have because you're on the border. Can you talk about that a little bit? And when you're done, I want all the guys to answer, uh, what, and you can work it into your question, 
if you think that when someone gets Narcan, should it be mandatory that they go for, uh, that they could be committed for like 20 days, 30 days to get rehab before they're let back out? I think that's up to the medical professionals, but I know in North Andover, if we Narcan someone, they go to the hospital um, under the new PC guidelines. North Andover has what I would call the crimes secondary to the opioid uh, crisis, and that would be your, your B&Es, your larcenies from the department stores, your car breaks, and basically what people are using as a, a means to get money to buy more opiates. So we have that going on. And another thing that I know is as well in Boxford, is the commuting. What, what's happening is people are driving after injecting the, the drugs and they're impaired. They can't drive a vehicle safely and right. they're causing crashes. They're causing other people to get hurt. And that's something that we take very seriously. But it's also the legislature hasn't helped us out yet. We're talking about the implied consent law is all good for alcohol. When you get pulled over, you've already made an agreement saying that if I get stopped by the police officer and I, they think I'm impaired by alcohol, I'll submit to a breath test or face sanctions. This is the biggest thing I'm talking about with the opioid epidemic and also the cannabis uh, it, um, movement is there's nothing in the legislature to say if we think you're under the influence of driving a vehicle, we think you could cause some serious damage. We want to test you. All right. And that's that's one thing we're all dealing with now is, is how do we go around that. How, how do you handle it if somebody shoots up heroin, they get behind the wheel of a car, it's not like you can give them a breathalyzer. You pull them over, you know they're impaired on something. How do you determine what that is without violating their rights? I mean, it's Massachusetts, after all. And we know the legislature cares more about criminals' rights than, than you know, protecting the rest of us. Some officers have special training that allows them to make that judgment. Um, we do training with other officers just to give them a, a go-by. Um, but there are, there's a lot of ways to tell, believe it or not. Especially there is, really? Yeah, there is. How do you, guys, how do you, how do you handle it in Boston? I mean, you get the same type of community as North We're, Andover. you got people driving while they're shooting up. We have one officer who's a DRE. He's on the evening shift, so he's done a great job for us. We're also in contact with Topsfield, North Andover, so also other DREs in the area. So if we have concern, we make sure we check it out. Uh, Chief Gray, do you think that someone should have to, if they're not can, go mandatory for a certain period of time? Because I know you guys make them go to the hospital, but they can just check themselves out, right? The, yeah, I mean, in North Andover, to answer your question from before, we carry eight milligrams, two four milligram uh, doses. That's helped us with our overdoses immensely because, as the Chief Solomon said, the, the fentanyl is a lot more potent. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we've had to carry a heavier dose. And also, if an officer is exposed to it while they're given narcan, we want to have the officer to have one for themselves. Right. So right. It, 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 it depends, again, on the, a medical professional to see whether they would deem this person you know, a, a candidate for a 20-day program or if they're saying, no, they're not ready yet. They haven't hit rock bottom. What do, you, what, do you, what, do, what do the other chiefs think? I mean, if someone is narcan Shouldn't they have to go for some kind of treatment so that they're just not a constant drain on the system? Dude, Chief Solomon was telling me in, in the interview I did with him two years ago that he's finding that they're not killing people three and four and five times, and sometimes they're not coming back because their body's getting used to it. So, Tom, what, what's actually happened is not cans got stronger. So we were always carrying two two-milligram doses. We currently carry four two-milligram four, four doses, plus each officer has two four-milligram doses that they're only supposed to use on themselves in case they get exposed. So uh, sometimes we saw ourselves giving five or six two wow. milligram doses. Wow. Now maybe three or four of the fours. So we're giving stronger uh, dosage, which is helping. But obviously from our analysis, it's the fentanyl impact is why the dose is so much higher. Now, if you can get a paramedic there, they can give them an intermuscular shot of Narcan and they can use less of a dose and have a better impact. I firmly believe, and, and I actually had the opportunity to testify last year at the House and Senate's hearing on the mandatory stay. We asked for 14 days. If you if you overdose or you have Narcan used on you for an overdose, so even if there's not Narcan, just an overdose, and you're taken to the hospital, we ask that they have to go in, they have to be held 14 days, at least give them some time not only to immediately detox but begin a rehabilitation program. Currently, it's up to 72 hours. We thought that was at least a game, but what happens is it's up to 72 hours or medically cleared. Right. So they want to leave. The doctor told them. But what's happening is the doctor comes in, so 12 hours later, 8 hours later, okay, medically you're cleared. The Narcan has resolved it. You're not capable of a relapse because the half-life of the heroin and fentanyl is longer than the half-life of the uh, um, Narcan. Then at that point they're releasing them. So there's still a little bit of an issue, but I absolutely believe – they need to be turned into a program and then at least detox 
over a certain, even if it's three days, then try to get them to convince. And again, you really have to have someone willing to get help. But the problem is they they overdose. We knock in them. They go to the hospital. If the doctors clear them in 12 or 16 hours, you know where they are? They just check themselves up. They shoot up again. They go out and they re-overdose. And then sometimes it's the, the effect is even stronger. Right. And then you, you're running into a possible death. So that is definitely an issue. Chief Ryder, what do you think? Do you think that if someone is narcan I mean, it's a terrible drain on the system. I'm okay with narcanning them because they're human beings. We don't want them to die no matter what their circumstance is. But shouldn't they have to go into treatment for a certain period of time to at least give the rest of us – like a 14-day break. They need the break for themselves. They yeah. need to get away from where they are, the people they surround themselves with. They need a break just from the area they're in to try to get them a head start to get clean. Chief Denaro, what do you think? I'm going to guess it's a funding issue, right, Tom? Right. I mean, uh, it's a no-brainer. They need to go in. I mean, one of the problems that we had, and Joe kind of alluded to it a little bit, is that we were seeing um, ODs, and they were going to the hospital. They were getting a cab from the hospital, going back to their vehicles, still somewhat under the influence and driving off. So we started a program about two and a half years ago where if we take you on an OD, we tow your car. Oh, nice. So I like and, that. And that was something I did because they kept going back to the car. I bet Ferentini was all over you when you, the first time you did that. I bet the mayor was all over you the first time you did that. I don't think he's had a complaint yet. So really? Okay, well, a, good. Maybe I'm wrong about that. That's an awesome. issue with it. But, I mean, I did that basically because um, not only for their safety, but it seems that when they're behind the wheel, they seem to be crashing into to innocent people who are going about their business. And more times than not, it's the innocent people that are being seriously injured or killed and not them. Right. Uh, same thing with drunk drivers. It always seems that the drunk driver seems to fare better than the poor person that he hits right. in a car. So, I mean, I, I did it basically because I'm concerned about, you know, God forbid they hit a, a car load of, of, you know, with a, a soccer mom and three kids in the car. Um, I, I don't want to live with that. So we just hook the car and take it. If we take you to the hospital, we take your car. Chief Gray, what do you think about this Gloucester Angels program? There's been much that's been made about it. Uh, liberals are celebrating it. Um, uh, junkie advocates are celebrating it. Uh, health professions is celebrating it. Um, and then as soon as CNN started celebrating it, I got worried. What do you What do you feel? Are you guys okay with that? Well, I've spoken to the district attorney's office, and quite frankly, I, I don't think it was done right because we don't have the authority to grant immunity if someone commits a crime. So the program that they have is good intended, or good intentions, I should say, but uh, well intended, but it's not by the law. And therefore, I, I don't think you can just do it for the sake of doing it. You have to have the DA's office involved and, and the DA to be on board with you before you just venture out. It sounds to me like the legislature is really far behind on all this. You guys are on the front lines. You see what you see. And the answers that I've gotten here, and hopefully we've educated people at home, um, it seems as though they're not listening to you guys. I know that you had a uh, just had a summit of some kind where the governor spoke, and we actually have that video. We're going to run that in post-production when people watch this afterwards. Um and we're going to bring it back for another show. He seemed really mad. I've never seen Charlie Baker that mad. We're going to be talking about the opioid crisis with you guys uh, and the failure of the opioid crisis and what you guys deal with on the street versus what the legislature is allowing you to do. Um, if if you could get a, a state rep who had someone like Diana DeZogli or Frank Moran that had some juice or Linda Campbell that had some juice leadership, and you could get them to introduce any one bill that would help with this opioid crisis, what would it be? Anybody. I would say it would be the bill, Diane DiZoglio and um, the chairman of the opioid committee, Senator Flanagan at the time, she's no longer there, uh, had come to our city and we talked and they had us testify at the hearing. And in the bill was the mandatory hold period. It's no longer medically cleared. It's mandatory. You come in, you will be held for 72 hours. And after that 72 hours, you'll be mandated into a secondary program for X amount of days to be determined. Uh, with a minimum number, but a maximum determined by your um, your reha rehabilitation efforts and success. I would say for me, it would be the mandatory holds, not 72 hours or medically cleared. I take the words medically cleared out. And I'd add in a secondary step. I think from the experience I've gained from talking with a lot of individuals who are addicted or currently using or addicted and in recovery, they have said if somebody was able to give us that next step. We went through detox a number of times, but then we went home. And then we're home, and who are we with? We're with our friends. And then what are we doing? We're reusing. If right. someone could have got us into a 
in the intermediate step where it allows you to clear your mind. Not that you're not physically addicted, a more psychological addiction. Right. I would request a bill that would mandate the 72 hours plus a minimum of a certain amount of days to be determined by a doctor before the bill's written and a maximum that you must be held before you can be released. Chief Ryder, right. what do you think about the ANGELS program? Uh, do you agree with that, uh, uh, Chief Gray? Yeah, I'm not intimately experienced in it. We haven't had that problem at our station, so it's something that obviously we do everything. We try to work with the district attorney's office and make sure anything we do is definitely cleared through them and make sure it's legally and obviously morally, morally proper. Uh, Chief Chief Deneau, would would you be okay with the legislature um, changing a law to make it mandatory? And um, what do you think of the Angels program? Well, there's a few things. Uh, first is, is as far as the law is concerned, I think they need to, to have some type of mandatory hold. But one of the, the issues that we face is if you're walking down the street with your friend and you're high on drugs, heroin, and he's drunk. We can take you into protective custody at the station. I, we can't do anything with with the person that's on high. drugs. And, so and you can take you can take a drunk in, but you can't take someone who's high. Correct. That's they bizarre. To, we have to go to a hospital, and then they have to be examined there, and then the doctor looks at him and says, "Up oh, there, okay," and they can go. But I can hold you. What is it? Six hours? We can hold you. I mean, so right. there's a big difference as far as how we deal with people who are drinking alcohol and somebody that has a needle. It's a huge difference, which, you know, I think that needs to be addressed at some point. I don't know if it's going to because they're afraid of the liability. If you take them in the station and then they OD or they die there. But if they did OD in the station after you took them in, we have the Narcan there. You have your radio. You got your paramedics that are right next to your station. So right. I think it would be the best place for them as compared to somewhere out on the street without constant supervision by, uh, you know, a police department or, or a matron if, you, if your department has one. So. Um, as far as the ANGEL program is concerned, I mean, I, I again, I work very closely with John Blodgett, D.A. Blodgett. And, uh, is he as useless as he seems? No, he's, he's not a bad guy. John is John is pretty squared away. He's very pro-police. John is very pro-police. He understands, you know, what, what we're facing, what we have to do. Um, he's a strong advocate, especially for the chiefs. Um, and, and one of the issues that, that we had, as, as was alluded to, is that we're not allowed to make deals for the DA's office, they're they're the prosecutory arm uh, of this whole thing. We we make the arrests, so so you can't just arbitrarily tell people, okay, I'm not going to charge you, I'm not going to charge you, but I'm going to charge him. Right. You can't do that. So um, I was never really involved in the Angel program, which is why we started our own program. We've got the sergeant, two officers, and somebody from NFI, a counselor, who go out and we try to get people into the programs. Um, but uh, you know, we don't have um, we don't have a ton of people that come in the station and knock on the front door and say, you know, I need help. Usually it's when somebody gets caught or they overdose or they're involved in an arrest where you have an opportunity to kind of circumvent the path that they're on, hopefully, and get them straightened out. We're running a little short on time, and uh, thanks to Dave, he's going to let us go a little bit over. Um, thank God we're not on radio anymore, so don't everybody going, we have a hard break we have to take. We have to do news. Um, so we can go a little bit over because it's a podcast and it's the Internet. Um, and I'd like each of you to answer this answer this question. Whoever wants to go first, I think we can probably start with uh, Chuck Gray and move, move, Chief Gray and move this way. I was going to guess it would be Joe Sol. Uh No, we're going to start that way. Okay. <laughs> Come this way. So what, you think he's my favorite now? Is that what you're <laughs> trying to say? Uh, you're almost right about that. Um, so uh, the violence that we see in Lawrence, and I see it every night because I chase police calls in Lawrence with the scanner every night. Uh, sometimes I'm in Methuen because something spills over into Methuen. Sometimes I'm in North Andover, but I try to hide because – the they, they Sometimes you like even think it's Haverhill and it's Lawrence. Sometimes, yeah. right, exactly. So uh, what, I, I just want each of you to just talk a little bit about the the, the spin-off crimes that you're seeing because of the opioid. I know Chief Gray talked a little bit about the B&Es breaking and enterings and the stolen cars, but are you seeing an increase in violence? Are you seeing an increase in domestics because they're using these drugs? Are you seeing an increase in you know shooting, stabbings? Um, first, just preface this with the, um, the DA budget. He's actually got a program in place with the diversionary program for drug um, addicts. So he's actually taken a lot of positive steps to make things work for us because I don't have a program in this town of North Andover. So we're using the DA's office. He's doing a fantastic job. Okay. Um, as far as the violent crimes, we don't see those per se because a lot of times, like I said, the secondary crimes we're witnessing are the larcenies, the, the B&Es, the car breaks and whatnot. The only time that we see a lot of violence when it's drug related is because they go into like a, uh, a department store 
and they get caught and they know they have warrants and they know they're going to jail for a few days or they know they're not going to be able to, to use their drugs and they run, they fight and they, they make a break for it because it's better than getting caught. So they're going into Kohl's and they're shoplifting, but they're high. And the minute you guys show up, they freak out because they got warrants. They don't want to. So that's it's, it's not even like Kohl's, anything down at the mall, but it's, it's just any place where they know they're going to get caught. Right. And it's because of the, the withdrawal from this drug is so powerful that to them it's worth it. And that's the sad part of it is, is this drug is – if you've ever seen somebody detox in a cell for a little while, it's it's awful to watch. Yeah. Chief Denaro, I know I know your answer is going to be a little different because I've ridden around here a little, a little bit. Uh, what do you what are you guys seeing? About Our answer is entirely different. Ours are, are gang related violence as a result of drugs. Our gangs are interchangeable with Lawrence. They freely go back and forth. Uh, they're now starting to even go to Amesbury a little bit, uh, but predominantly when it gets hot in Lawrence, they come to Haverhill. When it gets hot in Haverhill, they go to Lawrence. Um, a lot of the shootings that we've had are over drug disputes or people who didn't pay or um, shipments that were misdirected and that type of thing. Um, gangs disrespect each other and it leads to significant problems and a lot of them are drug related. So yeah, ours are, our, our violence um, is significant as a result of uh, gangs and drugs. Are you seeing that the gangs are becoming more violent and more prevalent on the streets of Haver like they are in Lawrence? Like Lawrence, 10, 15 years ago, we had gangs, but they were like kids that were pretending they were in gangs, throwing gang signs around. Now we've got actual MS-13 members. We have actual Latin Kings. We have actual Trinitarios. Um, are you guys seeing that there too? To a certain extent, I think that it would be more accurate to say that it seems that that the gang members that we're dealing with today as compared to, say, even a decade or 15 years ago, there seems to be less of a regard for human life. And, and they don't seem to value value uh, the life that, okay. that's out there. And, and it's nothing to take a gun and shoot into somebody's house. Right. And, and that's the scary part is that they don't – there's no value. Right. And, and that's, that's very frightening for us. So the reason I have uh, all four of these chiefs here is because they come from such different communities. Boxford is very different from the rest. Are you seeing an, an increase in domestic violence? Are you seeing an increase in any kind of violence because of – the drugs in Boxford, or is it pretty much hush-hush? I mean, are they going to other communities to do their stuff and then just coming home going to bed? We see some in the traffic stops. Motor vehicle issues is coming through. you got and 95 then, runs right through you, right? And then we also see calls for more services to the family. And we do discuss as far as having a 14-day hold period, if they are administering Narcan, mm -hmm. that's not only good for the addict, it's good for the family. Because a lot of these families are just hoping and trying to find something to do because in Boxford, they're taking their children in or a loved one in to try to get them help in the home setting. And if that doesn't work, they need a next step to get that person to it, to get them out of the house. And it gives them a break also, because a lot of the times we're talking to the families and they don't know where to turn next. They've tried different programs. They've tried certain things and they just need something to give them help also. So I'd like to wrap up because everybody's sending me instant messages from the audience saying we're way over time. Um, and we still have another segment after this. Can each of you just wrap up with, Trying to educate the public on something that, that is not talked about, um, something that you can that you can just impart on them about this. You might have addicts watching. You might have family members of addicts watching. Uh, one of the things that I always like, I'm going to steal one of the answers so you can't use it. One of the things I always tell people is uh, get get all of your opiates, get all of your prescription drugs out of your friggin' medicine cabinet because the first thing a relative or a friend that's addicted to something does when they come over your house is they say, what, can you use your bathroom? And the first thing you do is they go through your medicine cabinet, and you've got 35 Vicodins in a bottle. Suddenly you've got 10, and you don't know what until the next time you need to take one. Is there anything like that that you can impart on people um, as far as this opioid crisis that they can actually learn something with take away from today? Anybody? Sure, Tom. So what you just said, I actually talked to a couple of real estate agents who said they're having problems with home showings that people, as they're going through the home, are going through people's medicine cabinets. Really? Right online. Not only is it get rid of it, but make sure it's locked up. I think goes on yours. But what I'd say to people is situational awareness of your family. People say, ah, I knew something was wrong with Lisa or Johnny. So as soon as you see the behavioral change, the change of the friends, the situation that they're in, any change to them, you need to now take it the next step. And you need to explore and don't feel bad about going through their room when they're not at home. So, so real estate people – should be very, very cognizant of the fact when they're showing houses, they should be advising the people whose houses they're showing, listen, if you've got any, any prescription drugs around, just, just lock them up like during this period that you're trying to sell your house. That's, that's great advice. Chief Ryder? 
I'd say for families that are going through a problem or think there may be a problem, one, be vigilant, and two, reach out. Make sure you understand there's a lot of people going through the problem and make sure you reach out to a police or professional or someone that might be able to help and get some early information. Chief uh, Denaro. One of the things that I've seen personally is um, I have gone and we reached out to families of young people that we knew were addicted, and the families pushed us away. They want to handle it themselves. They want it to be quiet. My advice to, to these people who are considering that, in this one particular case, uh, the young man was dead two weeks later. Wow. And, uh, you know, the mom is crying at the wake saying, I should have listened. I should have listened. And, and, you know, what do you say at that point? And, and, and I think the best advice that I can give is that what we see with these addiction problems, especially with opioids, is that three or four times in rehab is not unusual. Nobody's doing this once and kicking it and they're done. Right. So you got to understand trying. there's going to be some failures involved, but you have to reach out and you have to reach out early, get them in these programs, get them on the radar screen so that they have a fighting chance to beat this. If you don't and you think you can handle it yourself, you absolutely cannot do a family intervention and handle it yourself. It is not going to work. This is all great advice, Chuck Gray, uh, Chief Gray. Um, I would just follow up with the three other chiefs and just say that uh, don't judge. You know, don't 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 allow a stigma to to influence your judgment as far as reaching out for help. We don't use the term junkies anymore at all. They're addicts, and and that is trying to take away the stigma of having that battle. And so by so I shouldn't use junkie anymore. No, 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 no. no, no. 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 And and that's. Part of the reason why your, your stats are underreported because people are afraid to call. Right, for right. Narcan. They're afraid to, to call and say, you know, they overdose. So uh, I speak for some of the other officers when you go to a call and they say, oh, she just dropped. She took, a, uh, you know, something else. If it's if it's heroin or fentanyl, let us know and let us take care of it and let us get you some help. Don't worry about the stigma that's going with it. Right. So honesty and no stigma. Um, talk to real estate people if you're showing houses or if you're having anybody come in, if you're having somebody who's vacationing with you. Um, and... and uh, just give me yours again, because I want to. I want to recap. I just want to make sure you reach out, let someone know reach out, about the problem. Reach out and talk to discuss someone. Discuss with the police department, with the fire department. We have plenty of people to help. We have a tri-town council, which is youth and family services. There's a lot of groups out there that are there to help, even in the tri-town community. It's very important. To get the help you need. All right, excellent. And and just recap what you what you already said. It's uh, it's a long process. Sometimes there's three or four failures involved. Keep trying. You have to stay on course. Yeah. Uh, one of the things Charlie Baker said as we go, to, go into our break before our last segment, one of the things Charlie Baker said at the summit you guys were at, I watched the video last night on Vimeo, um, you know, when, when we, we tend to tell people that if you fail at life, if you try to achieve your dream, if you want something in life that you fought for and you fail, you should keep trying. And then when someone uses drugs and they fail, we just call them a failure and we, and we put our hands up. And we have to stop doing that. We have to stop thinking, I mean – I know someone who's actually sitting in this room who had to go seven times for rehab before they finally kicked it in this room who's kicked heroin. And, uh, and when she's ready to talk about it, we're going to have her come up here and talk about it on a subsequent show. But I, I, my advice to people, and I'm not a police chief, but just from what I've seen, failure is an option when you're a junkie. Uh, I'm sorry, when you're, when you're addicted. Uh, when, when, you, when you try to get clean and you fail, that doesn't make you a failure. It just means you have to try again. So sure. uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. I really think we've educated people into a lot of stuff today. Hopefully you guys all had fun and you'll come back, but just not all at the same time. All right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much, Chief. Thanks. We'll be back after this. I'm paying attention where everybody gets it except Colonel Sam Pumpkin and Blah, 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 blah. All right, we are back here on the Paying Attention Television Podcast Program. Settle down now, guys. We're on the air. Settle down, settle down. Thanks. We have a live studio audience. If you want to join us next week on Thursday at 2 o'clock, uh, you come to Two Guys Smoke Shop. We're up on the second floor. It's an amazing studio. There's a radio studio here. There's a, there's a TV studio, which is what we're using. And in the back, you can't see him, but Sean the Barista is uh, one of our favorite guys in the world. He's making my <laughs> coffee right now. And uh, I, I, I'm not sure why we have Sean the Barista making me coffee because I, I'm pretty sure I put it in my contract that a woman has to serve my coffee, being the sexist that I am. Um, but um, coffee's coffee, I guess, right, Kiana? <laughs> coffee's coffee. So um, we've talked about a lot of things on this program. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that 
we talked about. Oh, here he is, Sean the Barista. This is awesome. Yeah, we need, we need to. But Sean the Barista. Let's see if it's right. Let's see if it's right. This is why we need women to make my coffee. This is the moment. Oh, that's good. <laughs> very, very good. See that? All right. So I, for some reason, I keep wanting to give a phone number up because I've been in radio for so long that whenever we come back from a break, I'm giving a phone number. Um, I've got a bunch of stuff that I just want to wrap up the show with. Um, we're trying to model this television podcast after my radio show. Some stuff's going to work. Some stuff's not going to work. We're just kind of throw, throwing as much shit against the wall as we can and hoping that it sticks. So when you come in next week and you start watching the Paying Attention television podcast, uh, it might be a little bit different, but we're going to try and keep the, the, the feel of what we do. Um, and that's mostly my snarkiness, right? The fact that, like, you know, I have an opinion on everything. Yes. Um, we talked about a lot of things today. One of the things that Fred and Meredith talked about during the news was the fact – and I want, to, I want to go back to this because I think it's important. State Senator Barbara Italian, who is a left-wing – Party partisan Democrat politician in Massachusetts. She's a state senator. She's running for Congress. So if you're a, if you're a left wing moon bat, if you're a progressive, she's probably your candidate. Um, she introduced a bill this week that would give poor people free state IDs. And I'm very interested in calling her after the show to ask her if now that poor people are going to be getting free state IDs, if now she has no longer any reason to oppose voter ID. And we know what the answer to that's going to be, which is going to be funny, which is why we have to get the answer publicly. Uh, but, you know, the things that, that, that we learn on CNN, if you watch CNN as I do every day in my office, I try not to watch Fox. I try to watch CNN as much as I can because we need to know uh, what, you know, what the other side is saying. I'm somewhat conservative if you haven't figured that out uh, by my, by my uh, Sarah Palin doll and my, uh, my Donald Trump doll over here. Um, we're trying to dress up the studio a little bit as much as we can uh, personally. But, you know, we get told things that are total lies, total lies by CNN, even Fox, MSNBC, CBS, The New York Times, The Boston Globe. One of those things is that voter ID is racist, that we can't have voter ID in, in America because poor people – and by the way, poor is always code for minority. Uh, whenever a Democrat is talking, you have to have like a, a, a liberal to English dictionary with you so you know what they're saying. Um, Poor usually means minority. So their argument against voter ID is that poor people and minorities will be disenfranchised from being able to vote because they won't have an ID. And yet here we have Barbara Italian who voted, who, who, who introduced a measure um, to give poor people IDs. Watch how quickly they change their answer. If the governor signs this bill and they give free IDs to poor people, i.e., minorities. You watch how suddenly they're against voter ID for a totally different reason. You watch, like, within a minute of Charlie Baker signing this bill, it's going to be a totally different excuse why they can't support voter ID. You watch. That's right. um, and and the, the continued lies over and over and over. Let me tell you why the voter ID narrative that you see on CNN, ABC, NBC, and, and, and the rest of the liberal media. And please don't email me and say, what about Fox? They're not liberal. Yeah, there's one. OK, so hold your emails. I don't want to hear it. There's one conservative network and the rest of them are all left wing, progressive and pandering. In fact, CNN is not even news. CNN is not even news anymore. It's entertainment for Trump bashing. It's entertainment for the left. It's an entertainment show for people who hate Donald Trump. And Fox isn't news anymore, although their news is a little better. Fox is just an entertainment show for people who love Donald Trump. So I'm really sick and tired of it. I put on Fox and... I just want news. I just want the news. Just please just tell me what happened. And instead, Sean Hannity's jumping up and down with his, with his pom-poms cheerleading for Donald Trump. And then I flip over to CNN, and it's Donald Trump used his salad fork today to eat his dinner. Is that presidential? Is that appropriate? And then we're going to have a two-hour panel discussion to talk about how Donald Trump is a secret Russian spy every minute of every day. And these concepts that they're constantly trying to put out to brainwash the public can very easily be dispelled. How do we do that? Just look at Lawrence. That should be the answer every time someone asks that question. How do you know if what the media is telling you is true or not true? Just look at Lawrence. If you look at Lawrence on the ground, exactly what's happening in Lawrence, you'll know whether it's true or it's not. Here's a perfect example. We're going to actually edit some stuff into this after the show. 
I got a call about uh, a year ago from Giovanni Rodriguez, who's a member of a, uh, the city council in Lawrence. Uh, Giovanni uh, called me and he said, Tom, you got to get down to the old Lawrence High School on Haverhill Street. You're not going to believe what's going on down here. So it's probably like 10 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. I'm just becoming alive at that point, right, because I get no sleep anyway. I get in my car, no shower, no anything. I grab all my gear. I go down to Lawrence High School. And if you've ever seen Lawrence High School, it covers an entire city block. And out the back door of the old Lawrence High School and around the entire block are lines of people. And so I pull up and I'm looking for Giovanni and I find him and I say, well, what's going on here today? Well, Dominican citizens who have dual citizenship or Dominican citizens who are here and don't, you don't even have American citizenship, they can vote in this country when they have Dominican presidential elections. Now think about this. In Lawrence, you have people lined up around the corner to vote for the Dominican president in Lawrence because they're Dominican citizens. And every single one of them, and there's pictures on if you go to valleypatriot.com or you Google it, there's pictures up online. Every single one of them is holding a friggin' voter ID. No word of a lie. You've got the poorest community in New England, the poorest demographic in the poorest community, the Dominican community, the poorest demographic, the poorest group of people in the poorest community in, in New England. And they're all holding a voter ID. So I went up, and if you, it's on our YouTube channel, I went over and I interviewed people. And I was like, hey, what do you think? Is voter ID racist? What do you think? Is voter ID racist? And they were perplexed. Like, what do you mean voter ID is racist? Voter ID is not racist. We, we have it in our country. We can't vote for the Dominican president unless we have a voter ID. Here's the best part. I stood in line with these people. And I talked to them all the way until they got to the time where they could get their ballot. And the guy in front of us didn't have a voter ID. He had no ID at all. So the lady that was checking people in spun her laptop around and said, put your thumb on the screen. And the guy puts his thumb on the screen, and a bunch of things stop moving around, and his picture comes up with his address, his family address in the Dominican, his family address in Lawrence, Massachusetts. With his picture, they print it out, and they hand him an ID when they hand him a ballot. And when they finish voting, they dip their finger in ink so they can't come back and pretend to be somebody else. Now think about this. If a week later we have a presidential election for Barack Obama or for Donald Trump or for the governor's race or even a mayor's race, in that same polling location where these people had to use an ID to vote for their Dominican president, it's racist for us to ask them for an ID. Well, wait a minute. How does that work? If you live in Mexico, you can't vote without a voter ID. If you live in Puerto Rico, you can't vote without a voter ID. But somehow it's racist in America to have a voter ID? Are you flipping kidding me? And this is what I mean when I say, you look at what's going on in Lawrence on any national issue, and you just look at the microcosm of what's happening on the ground, and you're going to find out whether or not that national issue is true or it's not true. Now, I know I gotta, we got to breeze through some of this stuff, and thanks for coming and sitting with me just to keep me company. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, the, the other lie that we hear, and I'm glad that we had the police chiefs here, the other lie that we hear about policing and police officers and these kinds of things is that, well, you know, we shouldn't be able to have guns, right? People, too many people have guns. There's too much violence going on. The government, the only people who should have guns is, is the cops. This is what we hear from the anti-gun people. This is what we hear on CNN every day. This is what we see on ABC every day. We read it in the Globe and the New York Times every day. But these same exact people, the same people that are saying, hands up, don't shoot, all these cops are a bunch of white, racist, jackbooted thugs that are running around gunning down black people just because they're black. So wait a minute. These same Democrats, these same liberals who say you shouldn't have a gun and if you have a problem, call a cop, are the same people saying that the cops are gunning down black people simply because they're black. So what are they saying? Black people shouldn't be able to defend themselves? Like what are they actually saying when you put these two concepts together? The, the real problem that I see with the, the national narratives that are shoved down people's throats by our education system, by the media, is that they give you this hodgepodge of different beliefs that don't intersect with each other. And let me give you one more example. I interviewed Barbara Latalian about a month and a half ago. She supported, and I believe she sponsored a bill, uh, making it illegal to use your cell phone while you're driving. So it's this hands-free driving bill. If the cops see you texting and driving, they can pull you over. I was very confused by that because these are the same Democrats, the same exact people in the Massachusetts legislature who pushed that hands-free bill. 
are the same people saying that police officers are profiling blacks and Latinos. So why did you just give law enforcement one more tool to pull over blacks and Latinos without having any reason? Because all you have to say is, I saw him on his phone. Well, can you prove you saw him on his phone? No, but I saw him on his phone. So which is it? Are police officers jackbooted thugs who are out there gunning down black people for fun? Or should we have guns to be able to protect ourselves from those evil cops? Uh, is, it that, is it that cops are out there racially profiling blacks and Latinos? Or are they not profiling blacks and Latinos and we should give cops more discretion to pull people over for not like doing things like having their phone? Um, you know, we keep hearing these we keep hearing these competing messages. And we never think about it. We never actually ask any questions. A college professor tells you this stuff, you see it on ABC News, you read it in the Globe, and you just move on with your day without ever giving it any thought. My job on this show is to make you think. If you go to my Facebook page, my quote is make people think it's the only thing you can really do for them. That's my mission here on paying attention. My job is to come here and to give you what you're not going to get anywhere else. You're not going to get it on CNN or even New England Cable News. Hopefully, we're going to be able to do this every single week. We've got a great crew here at uh, Two Guys Smoke Shop. We're going to be here every week at 2 o'clock. Hopefully, we're not going to go two hours like we did today. Hopefully, we're going to be able to keep it to an hour after today. This is our maiden voyage. I appreciate everybody watching. I want to thank Kiana. I want to thank uh, Maddie. I want to thank my personal assistant, Christine Jaskot, who's, uh, who didn't – I mean, we, we, we totally underutilized her, but she's going to have a much bigger role later on. Uh, Ira, uh, Fred and Meredith, did I leave anybody else? Jonathan Bergeron. By the way, Jonathan Bergeron is the reason this show is happening. He showed up at my office a week ago and said, I know you've been wanting to get back on. I know you've been talking about doing a, some kind of TV podcast. I actually worked a deal with Dave over at Two Guys Smoke Shop. Why don't you come down and sit down? We've already kind of, we've already kind of worked out like all the details for it. All you got to do is really kind of show up and put a show together. So in 10 days, this is what we did. Hopefully you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next week here on the Paying Attention Television podcast, we'll find another another uh, another title for that because it's not really television, right? Although we're going to try and shop it to Tim Coco at HAV. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, John, Mr. Jonathan, our, our uh, side producer. Thank you to the studio audience. Appreciate it. And thank you, Sean, the barista. Excellent coffee. Thank you. Meet me at the Worthing House and I'll save a seat for you. At the altar where old sorrows go to die. Can't let me in here and some money for beer just like you always do And I'll tell you you're the greatest friend alive And we'll carry on like brothers even though we know it's a lie So leave, leave with your right All your friends and adversaries, well they're getting pretty tight You better Go home, go home already. The show's over. Jesus.